Welcome to the Building Science Education Series for the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Decathlon. I'm Paul Torsellini, and in this episode, I'm going to spend some time talking about the cost of zero energy buildings. We've stated in other episodes that every decision has some energy or environmental consequence, and I want to add to that by saying that every decision we make also has a cost consequence. So when we think about this graphically, there are two variables, starting with energy savings on the x-axis. The further to the right you are, the more energy you're saving. And if you cross the vertical y-axis and move to the left, you're using more energy. The second variable is cost, which we'll put on the y-axis. You're adding cost as you move up and saving money as you move down. We can represent a typical building by the red bar sitting at 0% energy savings. This represents a building that meets the current energy code. The height of the bar is a typical cost of building this building. We'll draw a horizontal blue line to benchmark the cost of this baseline building. And to create four quadrants on the graph, we'll also add a vertical blue line at 0% energy savings. Our baseline code compliant building sits at the intersection of these axes. The first quadrant is in the upper right. Buildings in this section of the graph have to spend money in order to save energy. This is a very typical way of thinking about energy efficiency. In fact, it is kind of the foundation of energy efficiency programs for the last 40 years in this country, and that to save energy, we have to spend money. And along with that, we start thinking about things like, what is its payback? What is its return on investment? These are all economic terms and engineering analysis then follows from this in order to prove what is the best technology for certain applications at the best cost. But no matter what happens, all of these will cost more money and the building project will have to somehow get additional funds to make this happen. That additional money might come from additional loans or it might come from something like a utility rebate program, but it all means we're going to spend more money right now. If we shift gears a little bit and go to quadrant two, this is where we are costing money and wasting energy. Now think about that. Are there things that we do in building design that cost money and waste energy? Well, if you think about it, there are some design strategies like buildings that have a lot of glass. Windows cost more than blank insulated walls, but windows lose more heat than walls. Why would one spend more money to waste energy? There are some design elements that we spend money on, but maybe don't have direct energy consequences, like marble flooring. Look around the room that you're in. Is there any kind of detailing that costs extra money? Another thing we often see is buildings that have curved walls even though straight walls are less to build. These are all design decisions that are made that can cost money without saving energy. So now the next category is where we reduce cost, but we use more energy. What's interesting about buildings in this quadrant is that we often spend a lot of time worrying about quadrant number one. Maybe we talk about having a more expensive chiller and what the payback is on it, or maybe we can justify spending more money to have a more efficient chiller based on long-term energy savings. At the end of the day, when money gets tight, some things have to go. Budgets are limited and initial building cost estimates are often high. And usually some of the first things that get cut are those things that are in quadrant one. If you need to save money on a project, it's easy to say, let's just take out the more efficient chiller since it's more expensive. And those buildings go from quadrant one down to quadrant three, and all that work we did on energy efficiency is often lost in order to keep a project within budget. It's less common to see big things like an all glass building getting reduced with less glass in order to save money. What happens is we end up with these battles between those things that are energy savings and those things that might be providing amenities or some special little detail about the building. You end up with this big fight between people in quadrants one, two, and three. You end up with battles between owners, architects, and engineers on how to spend money and what is appropriate. 
And what we really should be thinking about is quadrant number four. What strategies can we come up with to save money and save energy at the same time without sacrificing some of the other pieces? Are there ways to save money, save energy, and provide architectural amenities and detailings to a project? We did a numerical analysis where we took those costs and matched them up with energy savings and saw that a lot of commercial buildings we could actually deliver for less money and have a substantial energy savings. And it really formed the basis of this graph. What we saw was that at about a 50 to 60% energy savings, you end up with the same cost as our baseline code compliant building. So if you're already committed to spend a certain amount of money, you could build your building to use half the amount of energy at the same cost. That is shown here as 0.3 on the graph. Note that it is possible to build a building for less money than a code compliant building. That minimum point cost point is 0.2 and every solution below the x-axis is a less expensive building. Then once we apply other energy saving strategies, they tended to start cross costing more money. And then what happens is we can figure out how to design buildings around this and we can talk about what the value added is. Now, what are some examples of things like this? This is using windows effectively and placing them in buildings such that they provide effective daylighting, but sized a bit smaller than quote normal to save on air conditioning loads, which allows us to downsize the air conditioning systems. If you look at houses that are very well insulated, some of them need almost no heating or cooling systems. Compare this with other houses where we spend tens of thousands of dollars to provide heating and cooling systems to those buildings. And if we think about building design from this big picture perspective of saving costs and saving energy, we can have truly sustainable designs moving forward and we can readily achieve zero energy buildings without breaking building budgets. Recently, we looked at a collection of 90 school buildings, and one of the interesting things we showed was that these buildings had very good energy performance, and many of them were built for less money than conventional schools. And with these successful examples out there, you have to start thinking about why aren't all buildings built around zero energy? And we need to start thinking about this in those terms, that cost should not be a barrier to achieving high levels of energy efficiency. So how does this translate to making decisions? Well, it translates to making decisions in that we need to think about setting goals and we need to think about an integrated design team and that everybody focused on meeting the same goal, the engineers, the architects and owners, all have to want to do this. It all starts with elements such as the envelope design and the window design and getting those pieces right first. And we're gonna talk about that in future episodes. Thanks again for watching this episode. Please browse the resources materials we've provided on the cost of zero energy buildings and feel free to reach out with questions.